Hi everyone, and welcome to today's Plant A webinar on translational plant scientists, plant science and how to achieve it. My name is Katie Rogers, and I'm your host for today's webinar. This webinar series is brought to you today by Plant A, the open online community for plant scientists powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. I'd like to give a special thank you to all of our ASPB members who are attending today. Your ASPB membership dues help support and make these webinars possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today and use the discount code webinar10 to receive a 10% discount on registration. ASPB members get early access to these seminars. You can learn more about ASPB and the opportunities we provide at ASPB.org. Today's webinar was organized by ASPB's Environmental and Ecological Plant Physiology section. If you're interested in this topic, I'd like to encourage you to join this section as well. Membership is only $5 and is a great way to get engaged. You can join this group even if you're not already an ASPB member. In a few moments, I'll share a link to their page so that you can learn a little bit more about this section and get connected. All right. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Anna Locke, who is the vice chair of the EEPP section to start off today's webinar. Thank you, Anna. Uh, thank you, Katie. So I'd like to welcome everyone to the panel discussion today. And a huge thank you to Katie for really making this happen logistically. Um, we have a great group of panelists today um, to talk with us about translational plant physiology and translational plant science more generally. Uh, but before we get into the panel discussion, Bridget Krager is going to take a few minutes to tell us a little bit about what's going on right now with ASPB science policy advocacy. And then after that, we'll introduce our panelists and get into the discussion. So Hi. Oh, thanks so much, Anna. I'm Bridget Krager. Nice to see many of you. Uh, I work at Lewisburg Associates, ASPB's government relations firm here in the Washington, D.C. area. And uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about what's going on currently if, uh, with respect to translational science and uh, specifically with respect to the National Science Foundation. And if um, there are any NSF participants on here, please feel free to chime in on the chat if I get anything wrong. Uh, but I think it's pretty exciting what's going on right now, the National Science Foundation. They are getting ready to launch what will be a new directorate, the Technology Innovation and Partnerships Directorate, or the TIP Directorate at NSF. Uh, in the FY 2022 budget request, there's about $860 million designated for this new directorate. And the idea is really looking at use inspired basic research. So not basic, basic research like we know NSF uh, is, is bread and butter and not pure applied research. It's really at the, at the intersection of those and really focusing on that use inspired research. Of importance to the ASPB community, a big chunk of uh, funding is gonna be directed towards biotechnology areas. Uh, as well as looking at climate change, bioeconomy, things along those lines. And so really the conversation about translational science right now is very timely because this is something that we're hoping will get kicked off relatively soon. I say relatively soon because in DC, uh, everything is kind of dependent on what is happening with Congress. And as some of you have seen, uh, there's a lot happening right now. And so uh, we'll hopefully hear more from NSF in the next few months about their more specific plans with the TIP directorate, that this is gonna be a great opportunity. Uh, rest assured, the bio leadership at NSF has been pretty involved with TIP already and trying to get it off the ground, has been uh, helping, rather I should say, uh, get the bio pieces of TIP off the ground, having lots of workshops. But this is gonna be a work in progress. And I think they're gonna expect a lot of iteration back and forth with the community about how this new, new directorate will be formed. And so again, I think having this conversation about translational science is really, really timely because we're seeing this really across the board. We've seen it at NIH, we see it at DOE. Um, the NSF is, I think, a great opportunity going forward. Um, so with that, I will turn it back over to the panelists to kind of let you know that's what's going on the federal side of things. There's still lots of moving pieces. Happy to answer any questions with respect to the federal side, uh, but this is gonna be a good opportunity going forward. Okay. Thank you, Bridget. So now uh, Larry and I will introduce the panelists uh, very briefly and then let them 
uh, say a little bit about their own background so that you all know where they're coming from in terms of their expertise and their experience. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Larry York. I'm a research scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory and it's my pleasure to help Anna with moderating this panel today. Let's get going with the panel introduction. Um, we'll name each um, panelist and then let them briefly introduce them themselves. Um, so up first, we have Dr. Kelly Gillespie from, uh, who's an RD portfolio manager for the corn and soy crop efficiency at Bayer Crop Science. Yeah, thanks a lot, Larry. Um, really happy to, to be here today, um, this afternoon for me um, in St. Louis. I've been seeing in the chat that, that folks around the world have very different time zones. So um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Um, I am a plant physiologist by training um, from uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, um, by way of, of background, you know, I was working on um, you know, plant physiology as it relates to, to climate change, right, and how climate change um, aspects might affect the soy agroecosystem. Um, you know, then did a, a short postdoc at the Danforth Center. Um, and actually relatively quickly um, went and became a physiologist at what the time Monsanto. Um, and so it was working in our, our biotechnology organization, designing trials. Um, I, I've always been very uh, motivated by, by impact, right? Um, what, what, are my, what is my science gonna do? And, and kind of more importantly, you know, is it something that I could explain to my mom? Um, my mom's really smart, she, but she's, she's a, a junior high science teacher. Um, you know, so, so I've always tried to think about, you know, my research and, and what I'm doing in, in sort of that broader um, sort of society impact kind of way. So, you know, I've, I've really loved, um, you know, my, I guess now almost 10 years um, here at, at Monsanto, now Bayer, um, you know, and as, as Larry mentioned, I'm now responsible for our global crop efficiency portfolio um, across all of our, our functions. So you think about biotech, gene editing, breeding, um, biologics. Um, if we happen to have small molecules that made corn or soy yield better, I would be in charge of that too, uh, but we don't. <laughs> so, um, you know, really, really just thinking about what's, what's the next thing uh, to have an impact on global agriculture. Thank you, Kelly. It's great to have the pers perspective from industry. Um, next up, we'll have Jonathan Lynch um, from a university. He's a distinguished professor at the Pennsylvania State University and who so happens to be my PhD advisor. So I'm very happy to introduce him today. Thank you, Larry. Hello, everyone. Uh, Larry just told you who I am and my position. Um, my interest is figuring out how we can get crops that yield better under drought and low soil fertility. And that has included discovering traits, understanding their utility and genetic control and deploying them in breeding programs. So our team has developed new varieties of bean and soybean with better yield under drought and low soil fertility that are being deployed in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Thank you. Thanks. So next we have Dr. Matthew Reynolds, who is a distinguished scientist at the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, uh, more commonly called CEMET. I think you're still muted, Matthew. Yeah, let me just uh, briefly introduce CIMIT. For some of you who may not know, CIMIT is a, an international public goods organization. Uh, I'm in the wheat program. We're responsible for delivering about a thousand new genotypes to public and private leaders worldwide every year. And uh, physiology, our job is to try to help the breeders. Sometimes they like that, sometimes they don't, but it uh, depends on the breeder. Physiology has always had a bit of a uh, mixed, uh, let's say an up and down relationship with breeding, but I think we're doing quite well now. Um, obviously the physiology research we do is very much field oriented. That's one way that uh, possible to convince breeders that uh, they, there's something there of value to them. And a lot of it is, is translational. We've, I've been very uh, busy in the last uh, 10 years, at least, putting together international networks uh, to connect 
academia, advanced research institutes with technologies that can be translated to breeding, such as the International Wheat Yield Partnership and uh, Heat and Drought Wheat Improvement Consortium. So that's a, 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 a big emphasis there, and that translates all the way to pre-breeding. Uh, like Jonathan said, we, have, uh, we, we send out nurseries uh, through the International Weed Improvement Network. People pick up those lines, some, mostly as parents, but occasionally one gets released and so on, because my breeding colleagues do a fine job of sending out elite material, which is what typically gets released. We're also involved in capacity building. We've published a few manuals. We're just about to publish a week textbook and training, mentoring PhD students. So that's it in a nutshell. Thanks. And then finally, we have Dr. Marianella Rodriguez. Uh, she is the Global Indication Leader for Pest and Disease Control and Global Strategic Marketing at BASF. Right, great to see everyone. Um, thank you, Anna, for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, I'm excited to hear about the discussion. I, I was excited to hear about it also because my background actually is evolution. So I came into a PhD thinking and plant pathology thinking, oh, I wanna protect the agriculture and the environment, but I got fascinated by evolution and I went from studying the evolution of sex in fungi and plants all the way to the evolution in virulence in many model systems. So never in my life did I thought I'm gonna apply my phylogenetic trees to answer questions in industry. And it turns out that that's what I end up doing, right? And today I use all that technical background all the way to the dark side to think what are the technologies that we need to have in place to address the challenges in agriculture 20 years from now, 15 years from now. So. So I think I, I went from like, yes, I wanted to apply research to like, oh, I love science and I don't care if it has a purpose or if it's applied just for the sake of knowledge all the way back into, can we make money out of these products and technologies? Um, so very interested in that discussion. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, thank you all the panelists. You can, the audience can see we have a nice mixture across um, various organizations. Um, now we want to get into the panel discussions. So I'll just explain how that's going to work briefly. We do have some um, planned questions to get it, get it going. We're gonna allow each um, panelist to offer a brief answer. And if they have a, um, a burning uh, re response or follow-up, we will allow that. But in interest of time, we will try to keep this um, moving, moving through. Um, if you have any questions that you would like to ask yourself, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of Zoom to post a question, and you can also upvote questions. Um, we will not have much time for those questions, so uh, please try to make use of the upvote feature to choose some of the most um, burning audience questions that we can get to at the very end. So with that, let's get to our first one and uh, that Anna will ask. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, to make sure we are all on the same page here, uh, definitions are really important. So we're going to ask each of our panelists how they define translational science. Um, and since we did the introductions in alphabetical order, let's go reverse alphabetical this time. So uh, Nella, could you please start us off? Oh, translational science. I see translational science as a science that uh, that develops something that can be applied to solve a need or a problem. Uh, and this could be in industry or it could be in other, um, in other aspects of human lives. And, and I'm a big fan of like um, a BSF, for example, we do material sciences. And I often look, can these materials help me deliver DNA into plants, for example? So, you know, you take something out of context and say, could this have an impact? In a, in a different application when you get to the core and the functionality of what you are actually doing. Matthew, could you go next? Muted, Matthew. Sorry. In the context where we work, 
I would define translational science or research as taking any knowledge that here, here too has not been applied in uh, crop improvement. And I mean by that actually applied in breeding or pre-breeding and testing it in a realistic context. And, and the realistic in that context, I mean germplasm that is relevant, numbers that are relevant, environments that are relevant. That to me is uh, <clears throat> translational science. Jonathan? Yeah, I think uh, I understand translational science to be um, when you have a real world problem that requires fundamental new knowledge to solve. And it can be initiated from both sides of the spectrum. Very often, you have somebody dealing with a real problem who knows they need new knowledge. And that stimulates that translational science. But sometimes it happens the other way around, where a basic researcher finds something that turns out to have application in the real world. Um, and I think we have to be, I'm a little hesitant to, to you know, be too uh, hard and fast with these definitions, because I think we all know in science there's a spectrum of very fundamental to very applied. And these divisions are kind of arbitrary, right? But I think of translation itself as that situation where you need some kind of fundamental new knowledge to address a real world problem. This is a hard one to go last on because um, I, I think the previous three answers are all awesome and I agree with all of them. Um, I think maybe just just to 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 ladder to build on on what's already been said. Um, I think it is a really broad definition. I mean, I, I like um, the, you know, the comment about, you know, maybe it's a, a material in the material science division that can help with, with you know, DNA delivery. Um, so it might not necessarily be the, the original intended problem, you know, that you think you're, you're solving that, that you end up solving, or, or maybe it's more than one problem. Um, you know, it, from a physiology perspective, especially as it relates to industry, you know, I've certainly been in a lot of conversations, um, you know, with folks in ASPB, NAPPN, et cetera, who, who really want to get, for example, you know, like drones into farmers' fields. Like if only the, the farmers knew the physiology of their crops. And it's like, from my perspective, that's not actually where, where high throughput phenotyping has the most value. It's, it's actually an enabling tool in the breeding programs, right? So, so that's still solving a problem, right? You're not, you're not, selling the drones to a farmer necessarily. Um, and this is a small example to make the point, right? But, but the problem you're solving is throughput and, and phenotyping, you know, as an enabling technology in a pipeline, um, you know, from a, in a breeding program. So, you know, I think being really broad about what, what opportunities there are for your science, you know, what, what problems exist for your science to solve and to be okay with that shifting over time. Um, cause you know, I think sometimes we, myself included can get kind of tunnel vision on the thing we started out, you know, trying to, to solve. Okay. Thank you everybody. And this kind of brings into mind that there's sort of a tension at times between, um, basic and translational science, um, because we never really know where the next big thing is going to come to come from. So in translational science, we often do have some target in mind, but we also know that a lot of the most important scientific discoveries were not intended. So in your mind, how would you balance um, the need for basic and translational science? And let's um, start in random order. Uh, let's start with Jonathan this time. Yeah, thanks, Larry. Um, I, I'm perhaps you know, I, the others may not agree with me, but we'll see. Um, I feel like we're in a situation in, 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 in the history of our species where obviously we're confronted with serious civilizational crises, global change, uh, hunger, uh, population growth, resource depletion, and so on, that calls for really urgency in this, specifically in plant science and understanding how we can manage and create plant systems to do a better job under these conditions. 
And I think that should receive more priority than it gets currently in the rich nations. And the rich nations are the ones that conduct most of the research. Um, of course, it's the developing nations that are feeling the consequences of this problem. Um, but I think if we if we if we uh, had a greater emphasis and greater investment on solving real world problems with plants, that would itself generate a lot of fundamental new knowledge that would have impact on our basic understanding. I'm not sure the opposite is as true. An uh, endless amount of research on you know very molecular processes in a model organism in a petri dish is, generates great fundamental understanding. The the history of how that translates back down to crop improvement is not very good. So I think we're kind of unbalanced where the rich nations are putting too much emphasis on basic research. That's my view. Yeah, fair enough. Um, Marianella, could you uh, expand on the conflict between or the tension between basic and translational work? Yeah, I, I think it depends on where you sit, right? If I If you ask me the question as a scientist, and making progress in the world, addressing the key challenges of the future. Um, if you think about CRISPR, CRISPR was discovered by a person that was obsessed about these repeats that he couldn't understand why they were there and why they were interspaced in a strange way. And today we say, oh, this is an amazing tool that will power not only genome editing, but it can be used for phylogenetics and so many other applications. And I say, if we didn't have a person obsessed over understanding the, the origin and the function. And, and you have many examples like that, like a restriction enzymes, right? Uh, they were an immune response to prevent foreign DNA. And today, this is a key tool that we use in any molecular biology lab, and we don't even think about it twice. So, so I see that all the applications that we have, either from the molecular biology toolbox all the way to the crops that we develop, these are powered by very basic understand it maybe and you don't need to understand it it just needs to work right for industry to to be able to pull and you know we did transformations in bacteria many years before we understand how the calcium interacted with the cell walls of the bacteria so um so i think both are important and they have to be balanced right i think if you look at the products that we have today they are powered by the technologies of 10 20 years ago and i see the po the products that we have in the market in 20 years will be powered by those basic understandings that we're, we're developing today. Um, so I think they, they both are equally important in moving. Um, it, we can have, going back to what Kelly said, we could have this tunnel vision and say, you, you know, I need resilient crops. And maybe the trick to resilient crops, it's in a tardigrade that lives out of space and not necessarily in the plants that we're obsessing. And, and I think that's what we could miss it, right? The, the thought that we know where the answers are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Kelly? Um, yeah, I, I think, I agree. I think a lot of the tools that we use have been, you know, found due to basic science, you know, but I think in terms of, of inventions, I mean, I don't know, I'm, I'm a big, yeah, I don't know, NASA space, you know, kind of nerd sort of, I mean, <laughs> um, you know, and, and certainly okay. from the US perspective, <laughs> yeah, you know, you think about like the space race in the six, you know, 650s, 60s, and just all of the, the science that occurred because of that funding focus, honestly. And, and that was like a government, I mean, it was a, a, a like full US you know, government funded, but across industries, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, therefore this team gets the money, right? I mean, it was across industry, across, you know, labs. I mean, it, it basically gave rise to our, our, you know, well, not gave rise, I guess, but a lot of our national, you know, our national labs are, you know, kind of founded in, in that kind of space too, right? Over, over the years, not just, not just the space race, but <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, right. So, so I think, you know, that level of national, and, and that was just national. So even you start to talk international yep. focus on solving a problem, gosh, you know, imagine the, the all of the carry on, you know, the, the sort of follow on applications and discoveries that, that could be, you know, found. I think that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's very true. It's clear that um, basic research has often led to applied uses, but we, we, we can also remember that many a lot of basic research has has not to keep 
keep that in mind. And I'm curious what um, Matthew then thinks about um, sort of targeted translational research where you're not necessarily only trying to achieve fundamental knowledge, but how do you have a target in mind and reach that target? Well, I'm not new to this. Yeah, I, I, uh, I think that I, I, I agree with both uh, all comments to date. Um, clearly, we do need fundamental research. And the main reason is because biological sciences are so complex compared with any other science that uh, it's necessary to have discovery research because we really don't know what will be the next frontier. I, I think there's a little bit too much emphasis on finding silver bullets. Those are rare and we shouldn't be aiming to get those. I think the, where my issue is, is that great discoveries are made, but then we don't join up the dots. And that is a problem for applied research. That is exactly a problem for the translation because to solve a real life problem, we need a reasonably comprehensive understanding. And so this tendency for academia to pursue a brand new strand creates islands of knowledge and in a way in balance. And I'll give some examples. I'm sure Jonathan would very much agree with me. We know a hell of a lot more about above ground plant structures than we do about below ground plant structures. And that has nothing to do with science. That's just because we don't like getting our hands and feet dirty. Uh, and because of the logistical challenges. You could argue the same about how much we know about respiration versus photosynthesis. Or you even looking at photosynthesis, we know a lot about leaf photosynthesis and almost nothing about spike photosynthesis. And there's no real scientific reason for that other than the logistical challenges. So to me, it suggests that we need to be a little bit more systematic with our um, upstream research and translational research can help join those dots as long as it's respected. And I think that one of my, uh, the director of the IWI project calls this gap between what we do in breeding and what we do in academia, the valley of death, because it's, uh, it's kind of a bottleneck. There's just not enough investment in that space. It's not as sexy. It's not as rewarding for us as a career. And that's something that I think we need to change to address the urgency uh, that we have with respect to um, meeting, meeting the, uh, or achieving food security in the future. Thank you, Matthew. Certainly uh, that's an important area and deserves further investment. Jonathan messaged me and wanted to follow up with this with a brief re response before we go to the next. You're muted, Jonathan. Thanks, Larry. I wanted to uh, lend my support to what Matthew is saying. And just for the, I, I know that many of the listeners or of the participants are early career scientists who may not be aware. I mean, Matthew introduced CIMIT, but CIMIT is part of a network called the CGIAR, the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research that was founded 50 years ago that includes 15 research centers and they're working on all the major food security crops all through the developing world that is having massive impact each and every year. I can think of no other organization that's having the type of impact for food security uh, that that CG system is. Now, just as a point of reference for this discussion, the entire budget of the CG system is one tenth that of Penn State University, which is just you know one university in one of the 50 states of the United States. So I think that in itself is a data point that should show us, okay, basic research is fine. And, and we have to be careful not to do a, you know, it's not a zero sum game. We need more research altogether. Mm -hmm. But I think it's clear from that number about how much money the CG system is getting that we're not funding this type of type of translational research to the level we need to, to, to achieve these, these goals that we all share. Thanks, Jonathan. That's an important point that it's not a zero sum game that we need to invest in, in research across across the board. So, um, Anna, you have the next one. Yeah, so we've been at pretty high level concepts so far, and I think the next question gets at more maybe specific examples. So 
what are major applied research needs that you have seen in your career where basic science has yet to bridge the gap? Um, that could be, I, I guess that could be as specific as you want it to be, um, but not maybe not just uh, solve world hunger. So uh, I think um, Matthew has yet to uh, be prompted first here. So if you could start us off. Yeah, I think there are many, there are many what that come to mind. Um, I mentioned some already, uh, respiration, uh, other aspects of photosynthesis, getting a much better, it, 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 I, I, I take the example of roots. We think of a plant canopy with its stems and its leaves and its architecture, but roots also have a canopy. It's just, it's underground. So we don't really see it as well. And, and uh, that, you know, that's an example with tomography. Yes, we can start to understand that, but these are tools that are still very far from being applied routinely, uh, even for choosing parents um, and in the field. Uh, and, uh, another area would be the rate of recombination. Uh, this is something that uh, many people highlight uh, as, as something that could improve the, the numbers game. We can reshuffle the genes better because you have linkage blocks. People are divided on that. Uh, pretty much any successful weed breeder would say, we love those linkage blocks. We don't want to break them up. But then again, you know, if you're bringing in chromatin from a, a, a cousin, it can be very useful to eliminate linkage track. Um, so I think, uh, I think there are too many areas to really give a definitive answer. So I just give you a few that I've been thinking about lately. Thanks. And, you know, I, I don't expect everyone to give us just one example that's, you know, the only important one. But um, Kelly, do you have any follow up thoughts? Yeah, mine's probably not going to be as as exciting. Um, I mean, no, those were good answers. I agree. I actually agree with the recombination comment. Um, I think it's about efficiency and scale. Um, and it's, it's tool building, right? I mean, we talk about like, well, CRISPR, you know, Cas9, CPF, you know, pick your enzyme of choice. They edit efficiencies, at least, I mean, efficiencies still kind of suck broadly, like to use, you know, widely. Um, you know, I think talk about phenotyping tools, efficiencies kind of suck. <laughs> I mean, you know, and, and I think there needs to be a broader acceptance of, of that kind of research. I mean, um, you know, a lot of the, the research that I did, you know, when I was publishing in crops, I mean, I would get reviewer comments back that says, well, this has already been demonstrated in Arabidopsis. Why is this novel? And it's like, well, nobody's ever shown this in soybean before. <laughs> you know, like that, that's, that's important, you know? So I think there's, there's sort of a lack of, of, um, you know, understanding that showing, even if it's that the mechanism is, is actually the same across crops or that photosynthesis in leaves is the same as photosynthesis in spikes, that is still important, you know, basic science research that I think would need to be done. I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I, given what I know now compared to what I knew coming out of my PhD, I certainly had a much clearer under, like personal thinking that I knew how crops, how plants worked coming out of my PhD than I do now. We have no idea how, I mean, the genetic diversity in corn alone, right? I mean, how are all the mechanisms working together across germplasm, across environments? I mean, it, we're just beginning to scratch the surface with the tools that exist today from, from a phenotyping and, and you know, data science and genomics perspective. Um, you know, so, so I'll, I'd say all, all that to say, <laughs> you know, tools, tools to improve efficiency and scale are absolutely critical. Yeah, I feel that in my own research, even as a physiologist trying to <laughs> phenotype moderate numbers of plants. Um, maybe Nella, do you have comments? Yeah, um, I think, you know, the, when you say this about CRISPR, I think what came to my mind was then RNAi, you know, and RNAi has been around, it was discovered in plants even before they, they pulled it out in the nematode, right? And, 
and it's been around for a long time and we're still yet to realize because of things like efficiency because of because when you go from one plant to the other one there's a little bit of tweaking that needs to happen um and so i agree that um that there's that risk of translation from one crop to the other one that maybe is undermined right just because they work in our up so maybe you can get it in brassica but doesn't mean that it's going to work on soybean and and i and i think and that's also there's that dimension that when you do something in the lab in one crop and you're obsessing over it, you do it really well but when you have to do many of them and a whole field you're then suddenly in another scale with a lot of the noise on your hypothesis starts to to come out um and and i think that is a challenge right and that is exactly where the incubation you can have a a proof of concept and you say hey i i prove that this works can we apply it in, in your crop and make a product out of it? And then 20 years later, maybe. But if you look at RNAi, I think we're still looking for those products. So there's a lot of people that, that claims that in actually in the animal world, they have them, right? They have some RNA, but in plants, we're still realizing them because they need to penetrate. They need to get to the right place at the right time very quickly to work efficiently. So they have a, the impact that they need to have. So. Uh, it, I'm not, it's complex. And I think plants are even more complex than um, that humans can be or animals in many cases. Um, so, so it takes a lot of connecting all these dots and community effort and partnership. Um, so I, I don't think one person, one company, one academic lab can do it, honestly. And this is what we see. We see that tendency to, to collaborate. Very good points from all, all the panelists. Um, the next question, I'm, I'm going to attempt to kind of parse some of the live questions along with one of our planned qu qu questions to start including some comments from the audience. Um, the basic theme is on training. And firstly, how do we get early career people interested in translational work to realize that, um, I guess they say ac academic, I suppose I mean basic research, how do we get them to realize that that's not all that matters? And at the same time, how, how would you, what advice would you give to an early career researcher who is interested in translational work? I hope that's clear. Um, Marinella? Yes, yeah, so, so my previous life and, the, life, and that's how I met Anna, I used to uh, do lead strategic collaborations for my company. And um, so I encounter, I discuss with a lot of academics at different stages. I, it takes a lot of conversation. So when you network, it's not just networks. You have to come on to a joint place where you're both interested. You know, I think a researcher has a key question they want to address. And I will say, can I apply that to any of the key questions I need to have solved or any of the key challenges? And, and to think that that will happen in one conversation I think it takes that back and forth, right? You meet in a meeting, you discuss where you're both interested in, right? Making the world a better place, addressing this, but then you have to zoom in. Um, and it takes several of those back and forth conversations before you define how could you play together um, in, into addressing one of these, these key challenges. And so I would say, talk to people, network. Um, you know, I did for a while at my company, I did cosmetics and, Plant secondary metabolites are huge in cosmetics. You know, we, we crush marjoram and oregano and this inhibits your methylation in your skin. So there's a lot of neat science out there that you can translate. Maybe you can breed for making more, more of those secondary metabolites. So there's a lot of, of neat things. So I think, I think connecting these dots is something that you could do in conferences by networking, by really being interested in, in how what people those might relate to what you do. Um, I, yeah, maybe, yeah, that, that would be, I guess, my thoughts. Oh. Thank you. Um, Jonathan? Yeah, thanks, Larry. Um, I think it's important. I mean, the process for most of us in getting an advanced degree is you get very specialized in a narrow field and you spend all your time in a very narrow, narrow topic and that's what you do and that's what you know. And of course, to have impact in the real world, that's not what's needed. You need to be able to work across disciplinary boundaries, to think about different things, to collaborate with people with different disciplines. That's what happens in the companies. 
That's what happens at Simit. It doesn't happen so much in universities, but that's what we need. We need young people to be able to think beyond their own discipline. And so I would say, take every advantage you can to go to seminars of people from different perspectives, to learn their lingo and vocabulary and interests. And whenever possible, visit and get to know the systems you're trying to affect. Go to the forest, talk to foresters, go to farms, visit a uh, tropical country. So you have some sense of what it's gonna take to, to make your work relevant to those systems. It's, it's, it, you can't assume somebody else is going to do it for you. You yourself should be cognizant of the issues. And I think if, if I can speak for the, for the private sector partners here or, or people like Matthew at, at CIMIT, uh, organizations that are trying to have impact in the real world want people who can work in interdisciplinary teams and think beyond a narrow perspective because real world problems don't fall into single disciplinary silos. That's a very good point about real world problems, Kelly. Yeah, I I completely agree. I mean, I I think it, it's hard to say, you know, oh everybody should be you know an inch deep in in a mile wide topics because I don't I don't think that's that's I mean we need people who are kind of like that you know but I think we do need people who are are deep specialists in a certain area, but but I think to me it's that communication piece. Right to say, you know, we need people who are deep experts in, you know, pick a field, um, you know. But but if if they're the only ones who understand what they're doing, then I mean that's like a lost opportunity, right? So so I think you know right now we talk a lot about oh everybody needs to to be a data scientist, and I'm like not actually like we need some really good data scientists. Don't get me wrong, but we need everybody to know how to talk to data scientists and to explain their their problems in a way you know, that, that is exciting. And, and, you know, then, then you can sort of share across disciplines. Um, one of the, one of the things I, I've learned and, and try to, to tell other people, and I even try to have to remind myself, we use the word collaboration a lot, but actually what we're doing is consulting that we're not, we're not sharing the problem with people. We're asking people to help solve my problem. Right. And, and we at, we say, hey, and maybe using the data science sort of specialty as, as an example, you know, we're like, hey, you know, statistician, I'm running an experiment. Can you analyze my data? You know, that that's not the that's not the way to collaborate. That that's not going to get you the best results, right? I mean, it's how do you how do you build your team, you know, with with a diverse group of perspectives and disciplines in the beginning and then co-create what you're, you know, the the goal you're trying to achieve. And then you're all interconnected and, and I mean, it's everybody's goal that you're working towards and you're working together. I mean, that's a collaboration, you know? So I think too often we, we try to call collab, you know, call con consulting collaborations and, and they're not, and people get frustrated because they're not, you know, they're not being heard or, you know, it's not exciting for them. They're just being asked to like, you know, write some statistics code for you. Um, you know, so, so I think it's, and, and there's a time and a place for consultation like that, that, that is needed, but I think just call it what it is and, and, you know, let it be more transactional, you know, and then we can sort of reserve the, the real collaboration, you know, reserve the language and the, the time it takes to build, you know, I think like, like um, Marinella mentioned, I mean, it takes time to build real collaborations and those are going to be much fewer and far between and that's okay, right? Like, let's just own that. Okay, finally, Matthew, do you have um, some comments on training and how to get people more, more interested in translational work? Yeah, sure. Um, I believe that uh, most people, especially uh, people who have the, the advantage of a, a good education and so on, actually, they like the idea of being able to contribute in a very positive way to society. Uh, that's part of our social nature, I would guess. And right across the spectrum from um, upstream research all the way to application extension, even, even being a farmer or, you know, there's a, there's a whole value chain where people can contribute. And of course, we all, it's funny because all of us, whether we're private sector, CG, academia, we all go through that same academic bottleneck. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I think it's actually a very good thing 
there are many excellent uh, aspects of science, but it does tend to restrict our, our view of, of the big picture. And so just like uh, I think Jonathan said, bringing people to experience different aspects of that pipeline can help an, a young person find their own niche. So I know when we have uh, the wheat, wheat week at Simit, people come from all over the world. They descend on this little place in the desert where I am right now, and they have a fantastic time. And I'm not just talking about the steak and tequila after the field day, but they get really excited to see what's going on in the field, the multidisciplinary aspect. They see everyone loves to see drones, that's for sure. But there's so many things going on. And there have been, like, for example, the late Bill Rawn, he would bring groups of students and uh, other, other faculty um, from different universities. It's easier from the US. They bring, you know, undergraduates and so on. I think that is very, very important. So people can see where they might fit in that spectrum. And I would say, at risk of uh, making myself unpopular, that if, if, uh, if we want to see people really move towards the more applied end of that spectrum, then you've got to basically say, well, don't expect a portfolio of publications in science and nature. You've got to be realistic. If you want to be applied, then... Um, and, you know, I, I have a friend at the Royal Society. He was head of publishing there for a long time. And he told me that uh, these metrics are not very meaningful anyway, except we all still adhere to them. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I've certainly been in a position where I've reviewed papers, say, for field crops research and then for nature plants, for example. And uh, the level of rigor can often be much higher in field crops research. If you go trendy, right. rigor can often drop off. Not necessarily, but there's, there's no rule that says a journal with a high impact factor is necessarily a better piece of research. I agree, Matthew, and know that Phil Croft's re research is indeed one of the most rigorous journals um, in, in, in plant science. Um, Marinella would like to follow up. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself, typical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love the point that we have to build that appreciation too, because when you go, you also, you know, we're very dismissive of the expertise or what other people built. We say, oh, well, you just push a button and that happens. And, and then you build that appreciation for the complexity of all the pieces that must come together, which is the other thing that happened um, when you experience. Uh, so not only you find your niche, but maybe then you respect that other niche as how it builds together. Um, so I love that point that Matthew brought up. That is a very good point, thank you. And Jonathan, do you want, do you want to follow up as well? Yeah, I wanted to follow up on something Matthew said. Uh, you know, we're all kind of, uh, especially early career people are playing the science game, right? And so journals have impact factors, right? Uh, and that's sort of an abstraction about how many people cite your paper. That's not real impact. I think the kind of things that Matthew does at Simit are real impact. The impact factor Matthew has from his work is far greater than any so-called impact factor from a journal. And so we have to kind of, if you like I agree with Matthew, if you want to do this kind of work, you have to be clear. Your impact is people benefiting and it's not some abstraction from a journal. Very good point. We may be finding ourselves using the Reynolds impact factor very soon. So thanks everybody. Anna? So we have a follow-up question uh, from, it's actually an audience question that it really links to what we've been talking about in terms of training and tool building. And also I think touches on Kelly's idea of collaboration versus consultation a little bit. So the question is, there's a lot of value to be gained by using computers to assist with developing new tools. For example, enzyme design to, to improve efficiencies. Do you think that we as biologists need to be looking to bridge into more computational methods? So, Kelly, do you want to start us yeah. off? Yeah. <laughs> um, full stop. Um, I mean, I think it's it's potentially an, an underutilized, I don't know, under, that sounds very grand. Um, I mean, 
you know, you think about the molecular biology tools, you know, that, that to some degree are second nature, you know, you can like order them and, and, you know, people talk about, oh, doing molecular biology in your garage, right? Um, I mean, and, and maybe, right? I mean, that took like a generation of scientists to become second nature. I mean, you know, you might think of scientists that were, you know, building their own restriction enzymes in an earlier decade that I'm sure I'm going to get wrong. Um, uh, you know, so I think we're kind of there from a biology perspective and in, you know, computational science. I mean, certainly breeding, you know, and, and genomics is, is probably, I mean, you know, I guess it depends on what you mean by biology, right? Because there's, there's areas of biology, you know, that are super computational heavy, and there's probably other areas that aren't as computationally heavy. But I think, you know, that, that just will become, you know, more a, a tool that's used as easily as, as you can order, you know, molecular biology tools these days. And I mean, maybe it's not even a generation, right? I mean, maybe it's already even here. Um, so yeah, the, the faster, the better. So maybe we can incorporate this question into that question to sort of expand that to, do you think that your average plant biology student who is not working on a computationally specific project should take the time to learn to do some computational biology? Maybe, and then uh, Nella, do you wanna go next here? Um, yeah, I, I will say maybe my personal story is that I am not a bioinformatician, but I learned how to parse other people's code together. And that was very useful to get things done, right? Maybe they were not perfectly done, but I can get to a rough answer and they go to the expert and say, hey, does this make sense and how's this wrong? So I think it helps you learn the language. It helps you analyze it. And today there's much more friendlier graphical tools that you can use, but understanding the concepts behind what are the, the parameters that you have to provide those. As a biologist, you have to provide those, those rules that are gonna be used to build a model that will be wrong, but you need to understand those because as the model gets better, then you can monitor how you know you have better knowledge to optimize it. So it's, it's, it's rewarding to understand it, right? But also I think it's necessary. So I do think everybody should know just a, a basics or have a really good friend that can help them explain those basics, right? Or a partner, a consultant or a collaborator. Um, I don't think we need to be experts on anything, but yes, you do need that. I would, I would recommend everybody to have a basic knowledge on how to translate their things into, yeah, key concepts for a model. Jonathan, do you have any, any thoughts here? Yeah, I, I personally believe that, uh, you know, we're on the cusp of, of, a, of a revolution in biology. Biology is so complicated. There's really no way to come to terms with it all without the tools of, of computational uh, sciences. And uh, but that, I think it's happening. I, Kelly, you mentioned it's already happened. Most, most young people are using R to do analysis and, you know, bioinformatics is fairly routine. And I think we're going to be saying, we're seeing that more and more in terms of phenomics, phenotyping, understanding the phenome. And I think, you know, what molecular biology was to people of my era is like a gee whiz, cool new thing. It's going to be computational. I think in 30 years, you know, the really hard problems are going to be all uh, tackled with the help of computational tools. So that's a, that's, a, that's a tool that people should familiarize themselves with. They don't need to know, kind of like what you were saying, Marianella, you don't need to be a, a programmer yourself, but you need to understand like, what do you do with this? What's it, what's it good for? And so on. Matthew? Yeah, um, I agree also with what Marianella said. Uh, it's not everyone is going to get turned on necessarily by quantitative approaches. People who do, um, they have a, a distinct advantage in many senses. So it's good to, to go that route if, if, if your brain, both sides of your brain lend themselves to that. Um, but it is, everyone should be aware of the power of those tools. Because like Maria Elena said, you can say, you can ask somebody or you can consult somebody. We, we always run to Jose Crosser at CIMIT, who's such an expert in biometrics, for example. And he's always studying up on something new, even though he's long retired. But, uh, you know, just take a simple paradigm like 
G by E by M, genotype by environment by management. Everyone has grappled with that issue. And you, know, you can even plot out a three-dimensional interaction on a graph. But in reality, G has any one of those has so many more dimensions than, than, than uh, we, we can really get our head around. G, there are many background effects, minor genes, major genes. Uh, the environment is like pre pretty much an infinite variable. And management has many, many, many aspects too, which we can actually manipulate. And so if you don't have a tool, if you don't have tools, computational tools, machine learning, et cetera, you're never really gonna be able to get your head around it with pure intuition. You need those tools so that you can grapple and find patterns that would take your brain too long to figure out or possibly you would uh, give up in the process. So that, so that what, the, what those tools find becomes part of your intuition and then you can use it and keep going in that sense. So it's an absolute yes, but it, you know, not for everybody. It's, it's, it's a tool that we need to be aware of, just as some of us are physiologists and others are geneticists or breeders or so on, biochemists. Um, we, we respect each other's disciplines. We go, and help, we go to each other for help, um, but uh, we don't necessarily have to be the one who knows it all. Very good points that for collaboration, uh, I think that really the central key to it is communication. So let's keep that in mind. We're almost to the end of the hour, but I had one question I really wanted to ask you all before we wrap up. So please keep your response very brief. I just basically want one or two sentences. Um, a lot of the discussion today on translational work for plant biology has been in the context of food security, food production. But what I want to ask about um, is translational work that is needed. How can plant science help fight climate change? And let's start with Matthew. You're muted, Matthew. And, and thinking, so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, my focus is generally uh, genetics and, and uh, physiology and for, for improving cultivars. So certainly if one is able to uh, breed cultivars that are better adapted to warmer temperatures, for example, more unpredictable weather, that is going to be important for preserving land, which currently, for example, is forest, a carbon sink. Uh, if we don't achieve that, then people are going to be digging up everything in desperation to feed themselves, and then the whole system will collapse. So to me, that is the most obvious way. But also, when it comes to um, you know, water resources is something that are really under threat and good crop management, understanding how we can get less wastage in our cropping systems. You said be brief, so I'll finish that with that. Thank you. Mary Nella, do you have any comments on how plant science can fight climate change? Oh, I, I think this is the holy grail, right? I mean, can we predict which crops are gonna be resilient and cope with the climate changes that are coming? And one year there's gonna be drought and the next year is gonna be flood. So what do you wanna plant there? Um, this, this is the question of our generation for sure. Um, I do have some ideas, you know, you could accelerate breeding um, and tools that cause diversity can help us, you know, hijack the systems to get there. But, but this is what we have to do. I, I think we need our, everybody's brain to, to get there and these networks on how can we predict it. Okay, thank you. Jonathan? The two are inseparable, Larry. We need better food systems to address climate change. Over a third of all greenhouse gases come from our food system. Uh, in order to live better on this planet, we need to develop better food systems. Very good. And Kelly, to, to finish up? Um, yeah, we've talked a lot about collaboration across science disciplines. I actually think we need things to come to market faster, which means societal acceptance. Um, I mean, I think there, there was a question in about regulatory systems. I mean, we all as scientists understand the power of molecular biology and how many biotech traits are on the market and, and who are the only four companies globally largely that have the money and, and you know, system to get you know, things deregulated. It's a huge bottleneck um, and, and, a, and a societal acceptance problem in my opinion. 
Um, you know, so, so I think we absolutely cannot forget, you know, ethicists, psychologists, I mean, just there needs to be a broader societal acceptance of, of these kind of technologies. And I'm not just saying that in a push kind of way. I'm saying like, how do we, how do we work together to figure that out? Hmm. Very, very good points. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And I'll let Anna wrap it up here. Well, unfortunately, we couldn't get to all of the audience questions in the time we had. It's already four o'clock. Um, but um, our panelists may have a, a couple seconds to type in answers there in the Q&A before they log off. But I would also encourage um, if you, if the audience, if you think of more questions, if you didn't have a chance to ask something or it didn't get answered, um, you can reach out to, to us, uh, ASPB, PP, and we can try to put you in contact with panelists if you have specific questions for them, or if they want, they could put their email addresses or Twitter handles in the chat. And um, I, I hope that it's a lot more conversations. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Larry, for organizing. And thank you to all of our panelists as well. Um, like Anna said, we will, I can keep a log of, of these questions that we haven't answered, and we can post those on the Plante community alongside the recording of this webinar. For any of you who need a certificate of attendance, um, let me know when you get your follow-up email from Zoom. Um, you can forward that my way, and I can get you a, a certificate if you need that for your, for your records. Um, Thank you all again for attending. We can stay on the line a little bit longer if you have other questions, but yes, thank you all for joining. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. All right, we'll see you all online and on, on Twitter for the follow-up questions. Bye everyone.